Congratulations, and I'm pleased to welcome you to this Beyond the Headlines event featuring Carl E. Meyer and Shireen Blair Brysag, authors of Pax Ethnica, Where and How Diversity Succeeds. Let me start with full disclosure. Carl is not only an old friend of mine, he was something of a model for me. Almost four decades ago, when I was a cub reporter in Washington for the New York Post, by the way, a very different newspaper then than it is now, <laughs> I went to Europe with a friend who was a reporter for the Washington Post, and so when we got to London, we had the chance to go meet the London bureau chief of the Washington Post, who was, of course, Carl Meyer. I was already an admirer of Carl's correspondence, and I was keen to meet the fabled man behind the byline. I can still remember looking with envy at Carl cradling his pipe and dropping bon mots in his Haymarket office, and I thought to myself, boy, that's what I want to be, a London bureau chief. <laughs> 25 years later, I became the London bureau chief of the New York Times. By the way, Carl became such a force in London in those days that he made regular appearances in the pages of the splendid British satirical weekly, Private Eye. Private Eye, as you know, gives people delightfully spot-on names. And Carl, with his bent for <laughs> dispensing instant high-toned opinion, was always identified as Carl J. Pipesucker. <laughs> By the time I got to London, the multiculturalism that we'll be talking about tonight was already under fire across Europe. Preparing these remarks this weekend, I dug out a piece I did on the subject in Britain 10 years ago. To do the story, I gathered together for a joint interview a group of non-white Britons, people born in Britain, but of immigrant parents or grandparents. We gathered in Sheffield, which is a gritty South Yorkshire city, and it happened to be the political seat of the then Home Secretary of Great Britain, David Blunkett. And I asked them what they thought of Blunkett's public instruction that they had to become more, quote, British, unquote, to blend in with the local culture. Their forebears had come from places like Jamaica, Somalia, and Yemen, and to a person they told me they felt more Jamaican, Somalian, and Yemeni than they did British. And these were people, mind you, who had been born in Britain. And some of them had never even been to the countries that they said gave them their sense of national identity. In Pax Ethnica, Carl and Shireen had pursued this subject in full embrace mode, using their practice skills as political and cultural reporters, as essayists, in Shireen's case as a documentary producer, travel writers, and published authors to produce a highly readable and informative book of rich narrative and penetrating insight. They journey to India and to Germany and to a former Soviet Republic in Central Asia. They even go to Queens. They take readers right into the lion's den of that debate on the continent, Nicolas Sarkozy's France, and they emerge with a knowing and enchanting portrait of Zinedine Zidane's Marseille. They are reporters, not proselytizers, so they explore the deficits as well as the benefits of diversity, but there's no doubt where they stand. They believe that diversity's upside is macro, that its downside is micro. And they dedicate the book to, quote, our two <laughs> Christian scientist, Episcopalian, Jewish, Lutheran, Muslim, non-believer, Unitarian, Anglo-American, French granddaughters, <laughs> our heirs apparent. They analyze what works in various places to produce multicultural tolerance, and some of the answers will surprise you. They explore whether the hyphen between citation of someone's ancestral land and their settled home country, whether the hyphen unites or separates. They point out the different ways that three great immigrant nations that had once oppressed their minorities, Australia, Canada, and the United States, successfully pursued the goal of becoming models of enlightened diversity. In a passage that will resonate in this neighborhood, they say that the, quote, misnamed international community 
has a record of impotence in addressing localized disputes. When it becomes apparent that little can be done to resolve civil disputes, they write, would-be mediators plead for ceasefires, UN Security Council resolutions, multi-party talks, United Nations sanctions, or a new roadmap. Staple formulas, they say, for buying time, removing a crisis from the overnight news cycle, and, parentheses, importantly, limiting blame. Compared to many of the books that we feature here, this is a feel-good book, a welcome quest for neglected oasis of civility, as they put it. In that connection, I wanted to note that there are books for sale at the door, and Carl and Shireen will be here afterwards to chat with you and also to sign the books. Finally, the authors note that ethnic groups who would be inhospitable to one another and in conflict, were they still in the lands they came from, can leave excuse me, can live peaceably side by side in far away third places like Queens. On this point, they share with readers a revealing joke they heard that goes like this. What do you do if you're gay in Columbia? The reply is, you move to Jackson Heights. <laughs> Please welcome Shireen and Carl. much, Warren, and welcome. It's very nice to see so many friendly faces in the audience. I'm going to give a short introduction and turn the uh, microphone over to Carl. And subsequently, we hope we'll have enough time for your questions. Carl and I have now written three books together. And as you can imagine, one of the questions we always get asked is, how do you get the idea for your books? So I thought I would start with that. Uh, and the genesis of Pax Ethnica, which happened over lunch one, about three years ago in the summer. Uh, and Carl had just read a book, of, uh, sorry, a magazine article in the Smithsonian by a journalist named Andrew Purvis on Marseille and how Marseille didn't become Paris during the riots of October, November 2005. Marseille remained an ocean of tranquility. So, um, what we thought was that, you know, as historians and journalists, we've had rather a depressing life documenting ethnic cleansing, ancient hatreds, genocide, and we thought it would be really nice if we could, for a change, do an upbeat book. So, uh, and we thought, well, there must be some places that we don't hear about where large groups of Muslims, Christians, Jews, and all live in uh, peace and ethnic harmony. But um, we don't hear about them because good news is no news. Now, in pursuit of this ethnic piece, we conducted nearly 100 interviews with mayors and maharajas, lower caste Dalits and Brahmins in India, factory workers, doctors and nurses, women's rights advocates, rappers in Marseille, uh, Kazan and Aborigine Chelni, diplomats and druggers, school teachers, professors, journalists, publishers, musicians, imams, priests, rabbis, social workers, youth organizers, and sports and cultural ministers, among others. How did we get the title for the book? Well, as most of you know, Pax is Latin for peace, and ethnos is Greek for people. And we're hoping that Pax Ethnica, the name, will catch on. It will be like other Paxes and have the same longevity as Pax Britannica, Pax Romana, Pax Americana. Now finally, how did we pick the pieces, places to study? Well, first of all, they had to have a mix of ethnicities. That would rule out a place like Japan, which is very homogeneous. Second of all, they had to have similar histories with different outcomes. For instance, how did, how did Marseille not become Paris? Why did Tartarstan not become Chechnya? Uh, why is Kerala peaceful and Gujarat is not? Uh, so, Finally, we could ask in our book, what went right? Carl? Uh, I, this works? Yep. It, oh, wow. Um, and Shereen left out something very important. When we write our books, we also bear in mind interesting places to go to. And in our various books, the Middle East, Asia, Europe, we always conspired somehow to add some good destinations, and this was no exception. Uh, this took us to across Europe into the Volga regions of Russia, 
uh, to South India, to Australia, and then to that exotic unknown land, Queens, New York. Uh, what we were discussing all of this and this, and we were just starting to write it, when the very term multicultural went viral. Uh, its faults were decried by the leaders of France, Germany, and Britain. Uh, here's uh, President uh, Nicolas Sarkozy uh, in a television interview. If you come to France, he said, you accept to melt into a single community, which is a national community. And if you don't want to accept that, you're not welcome. We've been too concerned about the identity of the person who was arriving, not enough about the identity of the country that was receiving him. Earlier, Chancellor Angela Merkel called multiculturalism, quote, an utter failure. This was during a nationwide debate stirred by a best-selling book written by a German central banker averring that Muslim immigrants made his country, quote, stupider, unquote. Merkel's comments were echoed in Britain by Prime Minister David Cameron, who claimed that under the doctrine of state multiculturalism, we have encouraged different cultures to live separate lives apart from each other and the mainstream. And on its surface, this is paradoxical since the European Union, to which they all are members, is itself a vibrant example of multiculturalism. It blends 20 republics and six monarchies whose 500 million people speak 23 official languages, three of which, English, German, and French, are working languages. However, it's not the usual Slavs, Celts, or Hellenes that provoke these lamentations. It is a specific minority, the predominantly Muslim, non-European migrants who began arriving in large numbers in Europe after the Second World War. Today, there are about 20 million Muslims in Europe, or just 4% of Europe's total population. Muslim newcomers and their offspring comprise an estimated 7.5% of France's population, 5% of Germany's, and 46 of Great Britain's. So reckoned at least the respected Pew Research Center as of January 2011. I should stress that such figures are estimates because since definitions are plastic as to what beliefs and what genes identify a Muslim, incontestably, as Islamic subcultures have multiplied, so has European concern about a possibly hostile minority. A quasi-backlash has spread from the Baltic to the Adriatic, along with the validly anti-immigrant parties. Their more extreme leaders claim that these Islamic interlopers are responsible for rising crime, juvenile delinquency, and the abuse of women through forced marriages and honor killings. Played down by the alarmists is the soft factual base for their worst, co worst case scenarios. Discounted or ignored are repeated surveys indicating that newcomers are either secularist or minimally observant, and that most aspire to a normal life within their host countries. Minimum, minimized is the hard fact that Islam, like Christianity, revels in diversity, and that is adherents are of many quarrelsome minds. I think we ought to, when we talk about Islam, remember that long before the Muslims arrived, Europe was shaken by ethnic disputes among predominantly Christian peoples. Thus, our first example is the city of Flensburg in northern Germany. Why this port city, which even our better informed and widely traveled friends had never heard of? Well, it was once at the heart of Europe's oldest established ethnic and dynastic dispute, the once notorious Schleswig-Holstein question. From Napoleonic times through two world wars, the Schleswig-Holstein question embroiled Europe's royal families and the national leaders of 11 countries. It twice provoked war between Denmark and Prussia. It fueled interminable press and parliamentary disputes, and it culminated in decades of partition, plebiscites, and after World War I, prolonged German occupation. Finally, after World War II, the British came to a newly liberated Danish government and offered to let the Danes have Schleswig back. The Danes thought about it, came back to the British, and said thanks, but no thanks, that they did not want to have a permanently hostile German minority on their border. So they agreed on condition that the new Bonn government agreed to protect the rights, to guarantee the rights of the Danish-speaking minority, their cultural, religious, and political rights. In short, 
The Danes chose to swap land for peace. The best evidence that it succeeded is that few today ever hear about Flensburg, where you have a choice of identities. You can be Danish or you can be German. And the agreement says that nobody can challenge your choice. You can be anyone, you want, but you can, you can choose, and it can't, be, it can't be questioned as to whether you speak the language or who your parents are. That's it. So in short, peace Trump territory. And our visit to Flensburg suggested that multiple loyalties and languages can be creatively reconciled. I should add that the agreement provided a precedent for similar arrangements, most notably in Italy, where uh, the northern provinces of Alto Adige, which had been part of Austria and were ceded to Italy uh, after World War I, have been guaranteed similar language and autonomy and cultural autonomy. Similarly, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, the peoples of the ethnically diverse Republic of Tatarstan stretched the meaning of the spongy word sovereignty in an astute bargain with Moscow. In Soviet times, I recall a bit of relevant history. The, the Soviet Union was divided into 15 Union republics and 18 autonomous republics, the joke then being that the republics were neither autonomous nor republic. Uh, but when the Soviet Union collapsed, the question came of what status the various national parts of the Soviet Union would have. It chanced that in in, in Charterstan, you had an extremely shrewd, uh, long-time communist, but very pragmatic president uh, named Mintamir Shaimiev. Uh, uh, Shaimiev. Shaimiev. Excuse me, I was looking at my script. <laughs> it's the name Mintamir, though. It said mean steel, Mintamir. Um, he proved to be indeed a very steely character who from Yeltsin, who was then the president, wrested a deal providing for the sovereignty of Tatarstan, but the word independence was never mentioned in it. Instead, it was a, a compromise where the Tartars had cultural and strong bits of economic uh, 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 autonomy, and the arrangement provided a real incentive for the uh, 2.3 million people of Tatarstan uh, who are about 53% Muslim uh, Tartars and the rest mostly Christian Orthodox Russians uh, to live in peace. And uh, the symbol of its achievement was the dedication in the year 2005 of one of the biggest Muslim mosques in Europe right next to uh, the renovated and rehabilitated Orthodox Cathedral within the uh, Kremlin overlooking the colorful city of Kazan. Um, we've turned as well to Marseille, France's second city and home to Europe's largest Muslim population. There are around 240,000 out of 839,000 uh, people who are Muslim in Marseille. Moreover, there are sizable uh, Jewish and Orthodox Christian minorities, roughly 80,000 each. I should stress that these are informed estimates since France does not allow census enumeration by religion or ethnicity. Yet in the tumultuous autumn of 2005, when riots and car burnings raged elsewhere in France, Marseille was calm. What this attracted <laughs> little attention in the media. It was, uh, as we journalists know, on news. As we found, Pax Ethnica there derived in part from civic branding. Residents of the great port conspicuously identify themselves as citizens of their city. And although there is a north-south economic divide in Marseille, it is not encircled by the dispiriting banlieue that are surround Paris. Uh, this was abetted by the policies crafted by three strong mayors who skillfully catered to all of Marseille's ethnic communities. Uh, the French political scientists use the word clientism to describe their strategy, but an American immediately recognizes it as good old-fashioned American urban pragmatism. And as elsewhere, we discovered that the youngsters revel in the unifying cadences of hip-hop and rap. However, this is an election year in France. President Sarkozy launched an attack on immigrants 
just 10 days ago, in which he threatened to pull France out of the European Union's visa-free Schengen Agreement unless Europe provides better protection from illegal immigration. The France you represent, he told the crowd, is the France of Jeanne d'Arc, the France of Victor Hugo, the France of Charles de Gaulle, the France of Robert Schumann, the France of Jean Monnet, the France of humanists. Well, how do you think that would make you feel if you were a Muslim? In South Asia, we explored the Indian state of Kerala, nicknamed, or they, they brand themselves as God's own country. It's about the size of West Virginia, but its population of 32 million exceeds that of Australia and Canada. Not only do Kerala's Hindus, Muslims, and Christians flourish, but they have led the way in literacy, life expectancy, and health care within the world's most populous democracy. And they are also rated the least corrupt state in India. The success is con their success confirms the vital role of empowering women, mobilizing the underclass, and encouraging intercommunal professional associations and promoting a skilled workforce. As Keralites, or Malayalis, like to claim, our citizens are always of export quality. Nearly a million are lucratively employed as migratory workers in the Persian Gulf. And against odds and stereotype, Kerala's voters regularly gravitate from an indigenous Marxist Communist Party to a centrist Congress Party, in each case is leading coalitions. They have relegated to the fringe the extremist religious and communal and ultra leftist factions that have spread terror and tears elsewhere in India. Our fifth example is Queens, New York, arguably the world's most diverse political unit. Here, 2.3 million people speak 138 languages. Indeed, if Queens were separatist, it would rank as the fourth largest city in the United States after uh, Los Angeles, Chicago, and Brooklyn. Brooklyn has 2.5 million. Nevertheless, after some rough passages uh, in the last century, the leaders of this remarkable borough have embraced diversity. They have turned hyphenated citizenship into a civic asset. Here we discovered an exemplary library system. It's independent of the New York Public Library. It's separate autonomous library system that provides newcomers with polyglot books, with job counseling, computer skills, and advice on seeking naturalization. And altogether, the libraries throw a lifeline to the uprooted. And here, school and community boards offer a meaningful political foothold to hyphenated politicians, such as borough president Helen Marshall, an Afro-Caribbean American, and a former librarian and teacher whose mantra is, visit Queens, see the world. You know, looking over there, I'm mindful that she has, when we saw her, she was very proud of her Marshall Plan. Her Marshall Plan partly comprises uh, summoning a general assembly at irregular intervals of all the ethnic communities in Queens. And she also issues a calendar each year of all the principal religious and political days, national days, of the ethnic communities in Queens so that all can mutually uh, join in the festivities. Finally, weighing the experience of the three biggest and essentially immigrant nations, Canada, Australia, and the United States, we found reassuring evidence that diversity works on many levels, economic, educational, political, and cultural, not least in the form of teenage rap, the universal language of outsiders in a changing world. We conclude our survey by offering 11 guidelines for promoting civility in diverse societies. Each is distilled from our own explorations, with a preliminary caution that every society has its peculiarities, and our guidelines are all subject to local circumstances. We'd be glad to enumerate them. I can go through them now, or we can go right to questions. Why don't you go through them right now? I've got some questions in okay. the minutes, and we've got time. All right, this is the one-sentence summary of our guidelines. Okay. Wherever feasible, choose peace rather than land. Two, take time to make the case, economic, cultural, political, for diversity, and do not leave unanswered stereotyped caricatures of currently unpopular minorities. Three, do not abjure the second passport or demonize the hyphenated citizenship, Greek American, Italian American, or African American, for example. Four, fear not the persistence of minority tings, tongues. 
Uh, five, in providing homes for new immigrants, horizontal appears to be more successful than vertical. Than vertical. Six, do not underestimate the power of professional, parental, and civic associations. Seven, use public libraries to give immigrant newcomers a welcoming space where not only books but DVDs are available in their mother tongue. Eight, make empowerment of women a priority. The better to erode barriers between ethnic communities, promote economic growth, smaller families, combat spousal abuse, raise health standards, and provide role models for children. Nine, celebrate differences of creed and culture with a calendar that records, re, that records the major religious festivals and national holidays. 10, recognize and celebrate the political leaders who pro actively promote diversity. People like Tartar Stan Shaimeyev, mayors like Marseille's current mayor, uh, Godin, or governors. And here I would mention someone that I know and was very much influenced by Puerto Rico's founding uh, founder of the Commonwealth status, Luis Munoz Marin. 11, do not underestimate the allure of popular culture, rap music, sports, to diminish class differences. And I'll end right there. Appropriate, we're having this conversation two days after the St. Patrick's Day Parade. <laughs> That's one of, I think I was number nine. Um, a couple of things uh, for this audience. Um, Kerala, by the way, is represented in the Indian Parliament by our old friend Shashi Tharoor. Uh, and I think it produces lots of writers, that, uh, that state, and he's a, he's a good one example. Another comment I want to make to you is um, that uh, about a year ago, we had Robert Kaplan come here, a wonderful writer who had written a book called Monsoon about the entire Indian Ocean. And I remember after reading that book, he, like you both, is a wonderful writer that evokes places. I mean, you really travel with them when you go. And I remember afterwards, there were a bunch of places I wanted to go, but the one I really wanted to go that he described was Oman. I've never been to Oman, and he described it so romantically. Um, I would like to go to all five places, um, by the way, including Queens, <laughs> uh, that you write about, because you write about it uh, with such feeling and uh, description. Um, and in the audience, I'm not going to point a finger, is, is a young friend of mine. He's actually, uh, he was a roommate of my son's at Brown University. And he ended up a couple of years ago working for the Queen's Borough President. And I wanted him to come tonight because I don't think he realized what a wonderful borough he worked in. He never brought back stories as dramatic as you have. I'm not sure, I'm a native born New Yorker. I used to be the city editor of that New York Post all those years ago. And I just never realized the distinctiveness of Queens that you bring up in the book, the library system, the community board system, the school board system. It's really a remarkable, I mean, it's a bit of a, it's a wonderful final uh, fifth choice of the five and it's eye catching, but you make the case for it very, very well in the book. Let me just ask you a couple of things, notes I made to myself that I just want to ask you to expand upon um, and then we'll go to questions. One of them is, um, and I want you to just discuss this a little bit. You make the point at one point that binary ethnic disputes fester more than disputes involving multiple minority communities. And sort of a, a, another thought like that is when multiples cannot get together, the problem is usually because of sort of meddlesome outside countries. Well, I'll answer the first part. You answer the, the meddlesome outside countries. One of the examples that we use for binary better than than uh, not binary, multi, uh, multicultural and better than binary, binary cultures, is the example of Queens in the 60s and 70s, when Queens was tra being transformed into a primarily white community into much more of a black community, and the blacks and the whites were going at each other. Uh, particularly in Lefrak City, which had been built in the late 60s. And then in the 70s, they'd lost a lawsuit um, over integrating Lefrak City. And Lefrak City went from being mostly white to about 75% black. And there, were, and there was white flight. All the worst things that could have happened happened in Lefrak City. Crime, all sorts of things. Well, that went on. And then suddenly, what happened in the early 90s, late 80s and early 90s, there was an immigration from both from North Africa and Jews from Central Asia. And they moved into Rigo Park and Corona, where Lefrak City is, but it borders on, on uh, um, 
we go park. And because these Bukharan Jews from Central Asia had always lived with Muslims, I mean, it's primarily a Muslim society, they had no problems at all getting along with North African Muslims. And they also shared a lot of the values. They're both very conservative communities. The women cover their heads. They're pretty much, the children are pretty much, you know, kept under uh, thumb and all of that. And they got, they, they totally transform Left Rack City into a place which is really a model now of, of ethnic harmony. And it, the, another example is 74th Street in, in, in Jackson Heights where Bangladeshis, Pakistanis, Sri Lankans uh, all exist side by side on, in their stores. They all shop at Patel Grocery. They eat in the Jackson Diner, Indian food. So these are communities that don't get along very well on the subcontinent. But once they move to Queens, they all pr have Diwali Festival. Uh, and they, they celebrate Eid, the last day of Ramadan, together. So that would be what I would say about how more is better than less. You, because they have had to make, the Indians, Bangladeshi, the South Asians, have had to make peace with one another so they can be represented uh, in community boards and things like that. They have similar uh, wants and desires, and they've come together to express those. I just add that uh, there's a, 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 an unrecognized, particularly in Manhattan, prophetic quality about Queens. The first real statement of uh, the North American commitment to religious uh, freedom was the Flushing Remonstrance in, I think, 1657, uh, which was initially rejected by the then governor of, of, New, of New York, Dietrich Nicker. Um, excuse me, Peter von Steiden, <laughs> old iron leg. And the, the farmers in Flushing appealed over his head to the governors of the Dutch West Indy Company who reversed Stuyvesant's ruling, and this, the Quakers were allowed to come. Uh, the document itself is now framed and in the Albany State Museum. Uh, that's one thing, but I think what we all tend to forget is not only did Queens have two world's fairs, but that in the structures, the leftover pavilions of the first world's fair, that's where the United Nations was born. That's when, the, in 1946, seven, mm -hmm. uh, they had to find temporary housing. And that's where the Universal Declaration of Human Rights was drafted, actually approved in Paris, but drafted in Queens. So Queens has this prophetic quality, and if we were very much influenced by a book by Roger Sanjak called The Future of Us All. We use that title for our, our epilogue, but I think that expresses at least an optimistic, hopeful idea about what you see across the street, across the river. I don't mean to keep this conversation exclusively in Queens, but I want to tell you that that a, a reference you make that goes by fast, but it's an interesting reference is, um, Kennedy Airport now is Ellis Island. I mean, that's where people right. come through. And Kennedy Airport, of course, is, well, actually, it's in Brooklyn, isn't it? No, Queens. Or is it in Queens? Queens. Okay, Queens. Another point, in case of Queens. Now, um, <coughs> the other thing I want to tell you, when I came back from Britain in 2004, um, my wife, who is in the audience, so I won't point fingers, uh, was watching a television show one day and somehow saw one of these TV shows where they tell you you can get yourself an entire um, set of furniture if you just go to this particular address, which is, you know, 68-so-and-so um, a Boulevard in Queens. And so we went out to Queens. We've been back about two weeks. And my experience over the past eight years had been Britain, where if you go to a city like Bradford, you're a former London bureau chief, sure. you know this thing. Yes. When you go to a city like Bradford, there is a part of Bradford which is Pakistan. Uh, but it sort of sits alone there as Pakistan and surrounded by the rest of a British city. We went out to 74th Street, got off the subway, and began walking. And on the first street there, and I remember remarking upon it because my experience had been the one I just described of an ethnic neighborhood in the midst of a, a Western milieu, was on the very first street, 
there was a there was a halal butcher next to a Korean Catholic church, Sorry. next to a falafel maker, next to a Caribbean sort of Jamaican jerk um, pork restaurant or something. And that was the illustration of the particular ethnicity of Queens, which is all these different groups all together, which illustrates your point well. Um, let me just ask you one last thing, Carl, and then I'm going to go to the audience, because I want you to tell a story that I found absolutely charming. Again, as a New Yorker, I didn't know it. Uh, it, it has to do with Washington Irving, and I didn't know um, what an extraordinary guy he was in this particular area. But you tell a story there about a person who called himself, actually it's the same person, but he called himself Mustafa Rubadub Kelly Khan. And under that name, he was really way ahead of his time, yes? Would you tell the story of Mustafa? Well, this is one of the magazine that was kind of a precursor to the uh, New Yorker. It was started by Irving and his colleagues around 18, 9, 10, or that period. And it lasted for two years. And they did spoofs of all kinds. And this was right after America's first introduction to the Muslim world in the Middle East in the fight with the Barbary pilots. So what Washington Irving did is he conceived the fantasy that a captain had been taken prisoner in New York and was staying here and was trying to understand the ways of this strange people. And he said, well, the first thing you have to understand about the United States is they conceive of themselves as the most peaceful people on earth, but actually they're the most warlike. Second, that what they really excel at is, uh, is words. They talk and talk and talk. They're slam wangers, he said. And he said, and the worst of them all are in Congress. He said, nothing ever happens in Congress because all they do is shout at each other. And so that was done uh, uh, when Jefferson was president. Uh, and we quote the letter extensively. But you know, Irving was fascinating. People don't realize it. it. It is generally known that he helped save and preserve the Alhambra by celebrating the Moorish culture of Spain. But what is hardly, I didn't even know it until we started doing the research. He wrote the first biography by an American of Mohammed, published in two volumes in 1830-something. Uh, and we went to all the libraries in New York, couldn't find a copy of it. I even went to Strands, 12 miles of bookshops. They didn't have a copy. We wound up in Sunnyside. That's the uh, home that Washington Irving had uh, near Tarrytown. And we found in the souvenir shop one copy of the English reprint of Irving's book. And uh, we explain in why we think this is important, because what Irving did is what we are arguing in the book, that he recognized the complexity of, of, of Islam. He, he deprived it of its caricature view, which was prevalent even then, by saying, uh, anyone who writes about the early days of Christianity has no right to lecture the, the Muslims on their factionalism. Well, he also um, developed the idea of branding. I mean, he's the guy that called, gave us Knickerbocker the Knicks. Uh, so, and, and, Gotham. Gotham. And, Gotham. and Gotham. And Gotham. So, and branding turned out to be one of the things that we found was really important uh, in our book. Because the Big Apple, as you all know, New York's now called the Big Apple, and people identify with that. Uh, in Tartarstan, the mantra is, Shaimiyev keeps saying, and it's a new, uh, the new president, Menachinov, also says it, the church is right next to the mosque. And everybody says that. That's the first thing they tell you in, on the Kremlin. The cathedral is right next to the Gul Sharif Mosque. And Hillary Clinton, while we were there, uh, came to Tartarus. I said, I wanted to see where the cathedral was right next to the mosque. So it kind of, it, you know, you think that's, that's kind of obvious, but in a way, you want people to identify with that sort of thing. The people in Marseille, OM, Olympic de Marseille, everybody is into the soccer team. And in fact, I, we have a Google um, alert that comes down. So everything on Marseille that comes down and the press comes down, and 98% of them have to do with the soccer team. That's the only news from Marseille is from the <laughs> soccer team. So this, this idea of identifying uh, with a soccer team, or the Mets in the case of Queens, alas, uh, is really an important <laughs> concept and uh, an underrated one. You know, that just... I, it's not another question, but just one last sort of line of inquiry to you both. 
Um, Shireen and Carr write this book. They sort of take you with them. They say, on this morning, we went to see the mayor of Marseille. We went to see uh, somebody in, in the different cities they went to. And, and, um, and I want to ask you, is, was there any kind of common reaction you got? Did these people know what you were trying to do? Did they, did they realize what they had, or did you have to sort of point it out to them? In other words, um, did they just think it was natural that all these groups got together, or did they realize that these particular communities you picked were kind of special in, in how they had tolerance for people from different backgrounds living in them? I guess what I'm asking as a reporter, you always wondered, what is that guy thinking I'm up to? Is there any answer to that that would be interesting as to what their reaction was to your line of inquiry? Uh, in a sentence, they were delighted to have us there. They said, no one ever comes here. And, uh, <laughs> uh, and that no one ever makes the point that you're trying to make. And we got, there were always skeptics who said, it isn't as great as you think it is. We have this problem and that problem. And we put that all in the book too. Yep. But predominantly, there was a sense of security. And where we really felt it is was talking with the, the rap singers and the kids. Um, when we talked to them in, in Tartarstan, uh, we said, are there any limits on what you can talk about in your songs? And this was one was a Christian and the other was a Muslim. And they said, well, in theory, there's no uh, limit, but we found it's better to stick around and talk about love affairs, patriotism. Girlfriends, uh, yeah. Uh, and not to get into any of the contentious issues, because if we did, we wouldn't be interviewed to the festivals they have all the time. <laughs> invited, yeah. So sort of self-censorship. We wouldn't be invited to festivals if we talked about, you know, what a... No, we tried hard not to romanticize or sentimentalize these but places. Also, uh, when we went to Tartistan and we were talking to the person that had been the articulator of Euro-Islam, a guy named Rafael Hakimov, and Hakimov uh, had been the advisor to President Shaimiev, and uh, he, when we asked him about why Tartistan didn't become Chechnya, he was, he was annoyed, and everybody was annoyed. They said, well, why would you think it could become Chechnya? We have lived in peace and harmony for over 500 years with the Russians, even though the Russians conquered Kazan and you know, quite a bloody battle and all, but we've always gotten along with the Russians. And we are half Russians, and of course we wouldn't. They, the Chechens come here and they are dying for what we have. So they were very, really indignant that we would think that there was any comparison between the, the leveling of Chechnya Grozny and whatever, and uh, Tatarstan. Uh, although the portion proportion of Muslims, for instance, in Grozny, to Russian Orthodox was similar, 45, 40, 40 uh, as it is in uh, Kazan, in Tatarstan. But now, there, of course, there isn't. There was ethnic cleansing in Grozny. I think there are very few Christians left at all. Uh, and they're occupying Russians. But that's that's about it. It's not a not a peaceful resolution. I would love to get some questions and comments. Oh, great! I'll tell you what we'll do, we'll do about three at once. We'll go here and here and there, and then I'll get to you on the second round. So listen to three questions. We'll answer them all at once. Wait for the microphone. Please identify yourself, and you have to hold the microphone up very close to your mouth so that the because we're webcasting this right now live. Uh, Jack McKenzie, I used to work with and against Carl competitively. Um, this is not about Queens. On two papers. But, yeah, right, on two papers. This is not about Queens, but I want to say, as I've been telling people, I can see my home from here. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm really quite more, I'm prouder about uh, to live in Queens than I was before you started. The, um, my question is, where are the other soft targets for you? Now, you've got five things, you've got a, a 12 point program 11 11 point program and so where are the other soft targets for you to make peace of the world <laughs> uh, do you want to uh, wait he's gonna, uh, no, I'm wondering, wait, the second one was well, that, that was I'm sorry second one was here uh, and Phillips in the front and then third one's there I have a couple of questions but first of all I am a friend of our presenters tonight and I want to add something to their bios if I may that Shireen is not only a television producer, she's an award-winning television producer. 
No, I, I want to do that. And Carl was on the editorial board of the New York Times, not just the Washington Post. There, I said it. Anyhow, I was. It is so wonderful to hear positive things. I mean, we have many, many book evenings here, which are quite extraordinary. It's a wonderful program. But as Warren will attest to, most of them are really about conflict and and um, the problems that exist. And this is really so encouraging. Um, question. I can understand why Lefrac City would um, somehow accommodate to the Muslims and the Jews being in New York and being in America. But Marseille bewilders me. I mean, there you have the, the Algerian Muslims. You have the Pieds Noir who came back to Marseille. You have some of the, the Jewish Algerians who left Algeria and came in, plus the others. Um, I mean, how can you, how do you explain the difference between Paris? You said there was a difference between Paris and Marseille. How, how, what is the difference there? And uh, when are you gonna do a book of giving us tips on all the best restaurants at all of these places, <laughs> especially Brighton Beach in, in Queens? <laughs> Peter, do you have to leave early? Is that why you're... Sorry. I'm going to interrupt and go right to Peter. Um, hi. Um, Identify yourself. Uh, yes, I'm Peter Pringle. I'm a sort of correspondent from here for British newspapers. Um, uh, Carl and <coughs> Shreen, I'm shocked that you didn't choose Wales, um, <laughs> or even perhaps Scotland, of course. Um, and there must have been uh, a longer list um, that you agonized over at some point, and this is a little follow-up to the first question, really. So could you tell us who else what place else was on that list, and how did you eliminate them? Okay, we'll, we'll answer those three and then get to that. Uh, let me start with the uh, Jack's question about other targets. Well, there were some very obvious ones. Uh, Switzerland, three or four official languages, I've forgotten how many. Um, an island of peace. With, it's a very special case, and the reason it's a special case, and this is what separates Switzerland, let's say, from Afghanistan, another landlocked country, is that all of the countries surrounding Switzerland, by common agreement, found it in their mutual interest to have an oasis of peace and neutrality where they could put their money in secret banks, they could uh, go back and forth, and this was going back to the early 19th century that the status of Switzerland was agreed upon by the French, the Germans, and so on, so that they were able to do this autonomously, whereas in the case of Afghanistan, it's a proxy battleground for a dozen nations. Uh, and from, right from the immediate ones, India and Pakistan, you know, Iran, uh, the former uh, ethnic republics of the Soviet Union, etc. And it, as a proxy battleground, uh, each of the outsiders has, a con has an interest in maintaining constant friction. So that's the, the reason why we didn't do Queens, I'm sorry, Switzerland, because it's so special. Uh, there are, yeah, lots of other places. I would also mention one right here at home, and that's Puerto Rico. Uh, Puerto Rico is very interesting. It once had a very, uh, militant nationalist movement. In fact, the Puerto Rican nationalist independencias uh, tried to kill Truman, uh, and they shot up the House of Representatives back in the 1950s. Uh, but along came Munoz Marin, who discovered that there was a halfway station between statehood and independence, and that is commonwealth status, that the Puerto Ricans would remain US citizens, but in return for not having the vote in the US elections, they got certain tax breaks and other breaks, and they were guaranteed cultural autonomy, a fact which escaped one of the presidential candidates uh, who was there recently, <laughs> who said that, of course, it's a condition of, uh, of statehood to have official English, which is not true. In fact, I was just talking to a friend who's a judge in New Mexico, another interesting example, and in New Mexico, uh, both Spanish and English qualify as official languages that in a court case uh, you can, you'll have a translator if it's, if it's necessary. But then my judge friend told me, uh, she was a domestic uh, 
court judge. She said, there are actually 23 Indian languages in uh, New Mexico which also have some guaranteed rights. He said, you have no idea what goes on in New Mexico. So here you have an example of, a, of an interesting thing that is so unfamiliar to Americans that a man running for president of the United States doesn't even know about it. Um, I wanted to say about the uh, other countries that Peter Pringle asked about, where, why we chose what we did or didn't cho choose some others. Uh, part of the problem when you do a book from the beginning to end, uh, publication date, it ends up being about two and a half, three years. And you're writing into news. And that's a problem. You know, if something looks like it might, we, we'd just been to Egypt. And we might have taken Egypt uh, because they have 10% cops and they got along very well. Uh, Muslims now, but you know, if we picked Egypt, my God, we would have been, uh, you know, in a state by the time the book came out. Switzerland was a bit on the obvious side. We already had two European places. We had Plensburg and we had Marseille. Um, Africa. Well, the problem with Africa was just that. You know, you, we'd look at some place and we'd say, oh yeah, and then we'd find out that they were exterminating their albinos. Uh, you know, there's, it's a basket case, a lot of parts of Africa, so that it was really difficult to think and decide uh, on a place in Africa. So we, we really didn't do that. We, we did try and look at places that were more or less stable. And we still were on pins and needles. You know, will, will Marseille have riots? Or what could happen with Tartarstan? Was Shai, we were there when Shaimia was president, and there was a transition uh, to another president and something else. You never know. Something else could have happened, but it didn't, fortunately. Now, uh, what Anne asked about uh, was the Muslims in Marseille and as opposed to the Muslims in Paris. Well, the Muslims in Paris, they've done studies on this, and the people, the, the Muslims tend to live in the Banlu, which are the, if you don't know, are the suburbs around Paris. They're not in the 16 arrondissements, which are the sort of heart of Paris. So they don't feel Parisian. They've done surveys, and when they ask these Muslims, well, would you feel Parisian? Do you feel French? No. They say, we are Maghrebian. Uh, we're from Algiers, something like that. They don't do that in Marseille. They say we're from Marseille, and we're Marseillaise, uh, which shows you the, the importance it is of really identifying uh, with your neighborhood and with your city or whatever. And a um, friend of ours, Andrew Hacker, who gave us our introduction to Queens, he's a professor of political science at Queens, he says, you know, first thing you've got to know about Queens is nobody lives in Queens. Oh. No, they live in Richmond Hill, Rigo Park, Forest Hills, Flushing. If you send a letter to Queens, it will come back address unknown because you really have to put these places. And people say, oh, I'm from, they don't say I'm from Queens. They say I'm from, you know, Corona. Uh, so that, that uh, it's, it's really important that identification uh, with your neighborhood and with your city and all. And I think it can't be stressed too much. All right. Uh, you were next, and then here, and then Kai. Hi, my name's. Is this working? Yep. Um, Annabelle Short. I was born, born and brought up in the UK, but now I live in Queens. Keeps coming back to Queens. And last year, I spent a year each week interviewing somebody along a street in Astoria, um, and obviously, totally agree with what you found about why diversity works in Queens. I also agree that it doesn't work very well in London. <laughs> um, and I'd be interested to hear a bit more from you as to. Why? Why Queens? Um, why not London? Is there anything beyond what you've already described along the lines of people's common experience in Queens? You know, people maybe are so busy working that they don't have time for communal strife. Um, and also, why is Queens so unsung? It's such a fabulous story, albeit a positive one. Um, but what, why has it been so neglected? Thanks. All right. The next one was, yeah, right here. My name is Donna Munker, and I have a very simple question. Uh, in your list of 11 points, why on earth would it be, is it better to build horizontally than vertically when you're thinking about housing? How does that, I would think it would be the opposite. Why does that contribute more to peaceable coexistence? All right, do you remember the third I had? Hi. Hi. Oh, that's hi, yeah. 
you try to get rid of me. <laughs> uh, as, as a former librarian in Bradford, I, I was just wondering, one of the lessons I, at the university I studied in Bradford, I arrived when the riots struck. So uh, one of the things I was wondering is, the lessons that you're mentioning, the 11 lessons, and, and then having seen Bradford in comparison to some of the other parts in England, how do you see these types of lessons? You know, do you see a pathway for how you can try and change these other places? Because I lived there when they walked down the street saying, we want war, on one side where you have Pakistani community and Indian community on the other side. And it was quite a cultural shock coming from Norway. So I'm just wondering if there are any ideas. Mm. Norwegians are everywhere. I'll answer um, the London part. And then, we'll, okay, take those yeah. three and we'll get some more. Well, um, our granddaughters live in London, and they live in um, Peckham, which is a very multicultural part of South London. Um, and they have, uh, on one side of their family, this is what Warren, our dedication, on one side of the family, they have a great-grandmother who was born in a shtetl in Bialystok, which was at the time Russian and now is part of Poland. And on their other side of their family, their father's side of the family, uh, their great-grandfather was a Bombay Muslim. And in between that, we have Lutherans, Episcopalians, the whole, uh, and the daughters are bilingual. Their father's French, and they speak, uh, uh, obviously, their mother's um, British and American. So, but the difference is, and we've been, we've spent a lot of time in Peckham, and we've been to the library a couple times in Peckham. Well, in contrast to Queens, where this library makes this incredible effort to reach out to the community, they have, if you go to the, the, the Flushing Library, if you take the number seven subway to the very end of the line and get off, about a block away is this incredible Flushing Library. It's a new building, newish building, maybe five years old. Well, they have a row of DVDs, half the length of this wall, in four Indian languages. Four Indian languages. They have Nollywood movies. Now, you've heard of Bollywood movies, but you know what Nollywood movies are? Yeah. Nigerian movies. Nigeria has a huge film industry. I'm not sure that the Flushing Library does Nollywood, but the Queen's Library has a demographer full time. And the demographer said, we have African immigrants here. Uh, that library should get some Nollywood movies. We have, and the Flushing Library has this poetry group, reading group in Korean. They have help in homework help in Hindi. They have uh, tax help. All of this, you know, IRS immigration, whatever, they have it all. And it's crowded with people all times, day and night. They've got, uh, so probably 60 computers with lines and lines after, you know, for kids after school. It's an amazing, amazing place. And the New York City libraries don't do that. The Bradford libraries, I don't think, do that. Certainly the Peckham Library doesn't do that at all. They have a few books, and it's not really, it's not a library about people reading Tolstoy and, you know, really good books. I mean, I kind of looked at the Flushing Library, and there are a lot of romance novels, clearly. I mean, I couldn't read the language, but it looked like Korean romance novels. And fine, if people want to read Korean, at least they're reading, they're coming to the library, they're meeting people. And the, this is this incredible resource in Queens that I, it's the largest circulating library in the world. Flushing's probably the largest single library. So you say, why isn't everybody doing it? It's not that expensive a resource to, you know, fund your libraries and get the immigrants coming in, meeting other people, socializing, in, socializing themselves in a way in their kids. We, we were at a reading group um, we were, we were in the Rigo Park in the Lefrak City Library, and we just had wandered in. This was the summer we were just wandering around. And we wandered in around noon in the summer, and there were a bunch of, say, four to eight-year-olds with their parents waiting to get into, and the, every single color of skin you can imagine. It was just amazing. All waiting in to get into a children's. They were, they were having a children's reading, reading group, and there were 100 kids with you know, 50 parents uh, at noon in the middle, you know, Friday afternoon. So it's, it's amazing. It's separately funded from New York. I, I, no, they get money from the city, but it's not part of the New York library system. And they, that's the one thing they tend to get when they make cuts, 
they tend to put that back. They, they've been able to fight off a lot of the things that the New York Public Library system has because the people feel very strongly about their libraries. Can I talk about this uh, horizontal versus vertical? That's what I want. Uh, our own on the ground experience uh, has made us converts to Jane Jacobs, who back in the 1960s led a campaign against uh, projects, these large warehouses for people that now are being, even in France, they're blowing them up. Uh, that's what we meant by vertical. I don't mean uh, a house, an apartment house of five stories or anything like that, but when you have uh, these penal structures, and we toured them outside of, uh, uh, outside, there's no sense of a neighborhood at all. It's going into a canyon, and you can see that it's a factory for alienation. And uh, I think that it was, in, in a way, it's, it's uh, an offspring of Le Corbusier's uh, uh, own vision of a, a brilliant city that would be. In Marseille. In fact, he started it in Marseille with, his, uh, with a 26-story uh, a building. But that is utterly unlike the penal places you see elsewhere which are brutalized. That's the word for it, brutalized architect. Whereas the, the single family things you see all through Queens uh, have created, they, they have some problems with them. There's a lot of people, too many people crammed into them and so on. But they do create a sense of neighborhood. And they create some interesting conflicts too. The Bokarians, for example, uh, came into an, an area where the Italian Americans had been. And the Italian Americans liked the front area to be gardens and grass. The Bulgarians put tiles on that and, uh, uh, and an outdoor uh, cooker. Uh, that was their own statement. Uh, so there are these controversies. But uh, I think anyone going out to Queens would begin to feel that there is a real sense of neighborhood in these smaller places. Uh, we've got time for three more. This woman's been very patient there. Um, and then we'll, do, well, actually we'll do, well, I've got five. Okay, we'll do these two right now and then we'll get to the last three. Um, my question's actually about the riots we had in England in the summer of last year. Um, because essentially they were not anything to do with ethnicity, race, multiculturalism. They were basically class riots. So while I would agree that Bradford is a very bad example of segregation, I'm not sure that the the frame of reference here necessarily is the best frame of reference to apply to violence in a country like the UK. I would say that you would actually probably be better to look at the state, and maybe the state does fail in places like Peckham, but there is an expectation that the state fixes these problems, and also that we fail in terms of equality and growth and economic justice and what have you. So I'd just be interested to know what you think about, okay. about that. Gentleman here. Thank you. <clears throat> I'm the Hungarian ambassador to the UN. And, uh, I was very much impressed by the Queen's experience, but I hope not to upset the discussion, not to derail the discussion too much. The examples you have mentioned basically were the examples of how to integrate immigrants. And all the questions, with the exception of Alto Adige, were related to immigration problems. Now, we have a lot of other minority communities all around the world, and many of them, unfortunately, last 20, 25 years, were employed in wars. They never left their country. Country left them. Or historic consequences came upon them, what they never asked for. Do you think, in those conditions, the 11 points of the program of Queens would be applicable there? Mm -hmm. Think about the Balkans. Those people never left their villages, and they found themselves in a different country. Alto Adige, they found a very different solution uh, than, than what you mentioned in, uh, in, in Queens. The, the problems, the original problems, and the attempts how to, to, to sort them out were very, very different. Thank you. Can you take those two questions, and then we'll do the Can I take the start off? Um, I should say that you know um, we have a chapter in our book called uh, Diversity and Its Discontents. 
And there we deal with Australia, Canada, and the United States, which are immigrate, immigrant societies that uh, uh, there or it was a dispossessed, in each case, aboriginal peoples. But since there have been waves of, of immigrants, and therefore there is a tradition of immigration and of integration of new waves of people. And uh, it's perfectly true uh, that there are places where uh, this is not feasible for various reasons. They're not immigrant societies. There is no immigrant uh, tradition. And you see that in Canada, for example, in the longstanding friction between the French speakers and the English speakers, and the feeling among the people in Montreal that they have been turned into helots and peons uh, for the English speakers. Well, there was an interesting thing, and we describe it, uh, when Pierre Trudeau saw that language was a key element in this. And so in the 1960s, he began campaigning and succeeded in getting uh, French and English both being official languages nationally. Uh, and that if you go to the Ottawa Parliament, uh, if you're a member of the Parliament, you have to answer in the questions in the languages that they're asked. And they can be either French or English. And if you want value your political career, you'll be fluent enough to be able to handle them. Uh, so that that's one way of saying how the, the language issue can be diffused with people with a historic grievance as the the French Canadians have. Uh, and I, I just want to say that you know, I, I'm not idealizing the immigrant traditions of the U Canada, Australia, and the US. We talk about the dark side of each. And I'm always amused at one of the great episodes in the 1930s was when Eleanor Roosevelt spoke at the Daughters of American Revolution at Constitution Hall. And she began her speech, fellow immigrants. A hush fell over, a shocked hush <laughs> fell over the audience. Uh, but there was a, a, a powerful truth in that um, sentence. Well, you know, one of the dark sides, I mean, there, there are many things which don't translate well into other cultures. Some of them, uh, we interviewed the mayor of Marseille, uh, Jean-Claude Godin. And midway through this interview, um, he said, well, you know, we've, we have sun, we have beaches, we're laid back, we're more Mediterranean, we don't have ghettos in Marseille, we don't have the Bonlou problem and all of that. But he said, I have to tell you, we have something called le milieu. Now, I'd never heard this word before, but it's the mafia. And he said, Corsican we've all mafia. seen <laughs> the French connection. And he said, well, he said, we have le milieu, and they don't want burning cars in their neighborhood, because if the cars burn in the neighborhood, the police come in. <laughs> so they tamp down this discontent. Well, so that's how peace, to some extent, that's, that's the inside story from the mayor of why Marseille didn't burn in 2005. But you can't say you don't want to translate yeah, yeah, that. But Shireen, when we tell other people what the mayor said, and we quote this in the book, they said, the mayor said that? Other, other, <laughs> other politicians in Marseille couldn't believe that the mayor had actually told us that. And in Tartarstan, it's a clan system. Everybody comes, or, or comes from village, the agricultural uh, sector. Everybody's a nephew of somebody in the government. The government are all Tatars. It's about 40% Russian, 40% Tatars, but the Tatars are in the administration, administrative job because you have to be bilingual. Uh, and most of the Russians, a lot of the Tatars don't really speak very, after all these years, don't speak very good uh, Tatar either, but the Russians really don't speak it. So there's no good, not going to be a president of Tatarstan who's a Russian unless he grew up speaking Tatar. So they've got the jobs. And, uh, and it's often, as I say, these agri people that went to agricultural school, grew up on farms, come to Kazan. And all of these people I have, and the nephews, the 40th wealthy man, wealthiest man in Russia was the, it's the son of Shymiev. Uh, you know, Taif, he's, he, he's a multimillionaire. Well, that's, there's, there's broad corruption in Tatarstan, not any worse than it is in the rest of Russia, but again, it's not a model that you want to recommend uh, for other people, because uh, there, there are these, these mitigating circumstances. But I wanted to bring up something about Canada. We heard Charles Taylor, who's one of the articulators of multiculturalism in Canada, and there was a Taylor-Bouchard commission in uh, Quebec. Quebec was having a lot of problems because 
uh, Canada decides who's going to immigrate, but they got a lot of Sikh doctors, but they didn't want people that didn't speak French. They'd like the immigrants and they'd like educated immigrants, but they want French-speaking educated immigrants, and that wasn't possible. They were getting a lot of Indians. Uh, and so there was a problem. Uh, yeah, I didn't realize this, that young Sikh boys have to carry a dagger. It's required. And uh, the school says, you know, no way are you going to carry this dagger into class. And instead of litigating and all, they came to something which was they called reasonable accommodation. The parents agreed that the dagger would be limited to four or five inches. It would be sewn in a in a uh, bag, and that bag would be sewn into the pocket of the Sikh boys. So the Sikh kids were wearing the dagger, but they weren't, uh, they could get into the schools and all, but that seemed to be a very good way of solving the problem. Uh, yeah, I think that uh, the contrast is here with the uh, whole question of uh, the headdress in France. As soon as it becomes an, an agitated political issue, forget the idea of reasonable accommodation. Uh, and that the spirit in Quebec uh, has been different, and they have been able to do this, partly because they bring together, not in a political or a judicial setting, but in a, in, in a, in a mediating setting, where people can come to an agreement uh, without being harassed in, in, in a public forum. We've got just a little time left, and there are three last questions. My colleague Maureen, then here, and then finally here. Hi, Maureen Quinn from IPI. I'm very interested in the case of Kerala. You haven't spoken about that, but the mix, and I believe you said it was Hindu, Muslim, Christian. Um, and if you could talk about that. And then here in the center. Yep. Yeah. Just wait for the microphone, if you will. I'll do that one. Coming out. Sure. I have a question, then a short comment about it. To what extent do you feel that housing and jobs make for Pax Ethnica when immigrants arrive? In England, in my youth, Leicester and Wakefield had huge immigrant populations and were peaceful. There were mills, shoemaking, there were no foreign restaurants, there was available housing as people moved out to better new tracts. So I do feel that's a point that should be looked at, the role of the economy and housing in Pax Ethnica. OK, I'll do that one. My last question to left. So, so we just have two, two questions to be answered. Phil, so, was this the last one? Oh, no, it was, it was, which is going on. That's what, I just answered those two and we'll be done. Uh, talking about Kerala. Uh, it's very interesting. One of the reasons, it's one of the poorest states in India, but one of the reasons it's a success are the Muslims have money. And the Muslims in most of India are the poorest part of the population. A lot of them, according to Hindus, were converted from lower caste Hindus and all of that. So they're looked down upon, and they are poor, and they live in ghettos. In, in Kerala, they do not live in ghettos. The, the Muslims and the Hindus and the Muslims, they, all along, they all live together. So if you, you can't burn down a Muslim neighborhood in Kerala because the, the Hindus are right in that neighborhood as well, as are the Christians. They have a substantial Christ, Christian population. And the Muslims are proud to say, they say, we do not speak Urdu, which is what they speak in the north of India and Pakistan. We speak Malayalam, which is what the Ker Keralites, uh, Malayalese, speak. So that that is a big help is and the Muslims are the political deciders. They they're about twenty five. They're very they they do vote and they're about twenty five percent. So when you're running between the communists every five years and Congress, the Muslims often are the are the thing that tips the scale one way or the other. So they have to the politicians have to address the Muslims. They have to make their their plea for it, so that the whole Muslim thing, because of the remittances in a way, that's why they're wealthier, is because they've got almost $6 billion coming in from Gulf states into Kerala every year. So that makes an enormous difference in the, uh, you know, very nice houses. They can't stay in the Gulf. So they, they spend their money, they come back to Kerala and buy, you know, build houses, buy houses and all. So it's a very different situation. 
You want to just... Hey, can I talk about Peter Skinner's question on the economy, housing, and jobs? Uh, first, it's not generally... We're not generally aware of it because politicians rarely say it. But the periods of peak immigration in the United States, Canada, and Australia have coincided with the periods of greatest economic growth. Uh, and there are reasons for it. Uh, one reason is, is that uh, the people who come in are a young labor force that uh, are going to be consumers before very long. Now, in earlier periods, the people who came were farmers, peasants, and whatnot. But now all three countries give their priority to skills, to, to, uh, to people who are uh, already equipped to do it and who are an, 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 an enormous asset to the United States. Another point that's not often made enough by politicians, that we benefit from uh, the immigrants. There's a, a, a facile statement that the immigrants take away jobs from native born and that they also uh, are free riders in the tax system. Well, a series of studies have been made, and we cite them in the book, uh, showing that in fact, uh, many of the immigrants put more into the system as social security uh, than they get out of it in the end, uh, that they are not free riders, but in fact, uh, uh, are, are paying full fare for this. Um, and it's also true uh, that the, the immigrants, uh, by and large, uh, are a natural asset, as we're discovering in the linguistic field. Uh, there are schools out in Queens, I come back to Queens, uh, where you have to speak two languages to go to the school, uh, and the, the Asian languages. And they're very popular, hard to get into, because that's a path to success these days. Uh, fluency in Mandarin uh, is one way of getting ahead. And now we have, for the first time, uh, Asian Americans who are elected to the city council. And we have a, a controller general who is uh, Chinese American, <laughs> in trouble, but uh, okay, on the way out. Uh, uh, maybe. <laughs> but, uh, but he's representative of this new influx that has come into politics. Excellent. At this hour, I normally thank the speakers, and I'm going to do that. But I really want to thank you all um, for your attention, for your great questions. It's been a wonderful conversation back and forth. Uh, so thank you, and thank you in particular. Thank you. Thank you.